you would you would you would breeze through this material. Okay. Uh, there are two fundamental questions here, right? First question is I'm putting in the chat. For those of you who can see it, right? Okay. What is data? Okay, that's number one. And then what is structure? What do we mean by structure? So how do you define data? Now when I ask you these questions, please feel free to answer right away and then put it in the chat. So when I ask you a question in the exam, what is data, what is your answer? So you should know that from your data structures class, right? The first class in this in this subject area. Can I say data is if I say data is some values, can I say that? So any value that is there, if I say six, eight, uh, Pratap, Actually, Pratap may not be a thing. Uh, yeah, why not? This, this is all data, right? Some values. Now, just yeah, as simple as that. OK, great. Okay. Now, just for the sake of clarity, let's make sure we define information. What is information? Can somebody put an answer for me in the chat? Because if you see here, they are saying data structures are clever ways to organize information. So what do we mean by, okay, somebody put it there from Sri Prakash Institute. Data and intelligence. Can you can you clarify what you mean by that? Give me an example. Sunday holiday. We got it. Okay. So, yes, there is some intelligence means there is some meaning that we are associating with the value. Correct? So, when it says Sunday, yeah, it is a day, but there is a meaning, oh, it's the seventh day or the first day of the week. Okay, Sunday is holiday. So, information is also called meaningful data. I mean, there is a lot of useless information also, but this and you assign some meaning to those values, like when I gave the numbers 6, 8, and 10, those are numbers, but when I say 6 feet, 8 feet, then I'm giving meaning. Those numbers represent maybe the height of the person in the application. Okay, that is meaningful data, which all interpreted data as we call it, and that is called information. So then when you say structure, okay, structure means some kind of organization, right? We all know from English language, to create a structure means there will be some kind of an organization. Like if you take family, family as a structure, typical family. You have a mother, you have a father, you have children, right? That's a unit, okay? So you're combining all of them into one unit called a family. So different applications have different needs as you know right when i design a let's say a student registration system okay uh, what is the meaningful information for me there meaningful information is students right because and then courses because students register for courses right but i start giving meaning to the data 
then I start organizing them, how I would do that. So data structures is nothing but a study of this organization, things like that. So for any given application that you develop, in general, you have, give me a second, I'm, my son just came into the garage and I'm making some noise. Okay, great. So any, any application that you build, there are two things that all applications have in general. Okay. When I make such statements, don't take it as universal truth. Uh, I provide only working knowledge, right? I'm not getting into too much theoretical discussion. In general, when you develop applications, like let's say a hospital management system, or a scheduling system, or uh, your Indian Railways train reservation, or air airline reservation, all of them have two things. Okay. They have data, plus they have functions. Right, when you go to a, a airline reservation system, like yatra.com, you make a reservation, you cancel a reservation, you verify your uh, train timetable. So there are different functions that you can perform. And what is the data in the, the reservation system? Your records, right? Passenger records, airline records. I'm getting a lot of nice uh, cell phone voices and all that. You may want to mute them as well, please. Think of it as other than Chakravarti Garu. That rule doesn't apply to him because he is on call and Murti Garu. So they get calls. They get calls from VC Garu and they have to talk. What do we do uh, as an application developer, or a solution architect, or whatever name you want to give, right? Yeah, you graduate. Let's say students, you all graduate now in another one year or so. Then you go become a software engineer. You come and, and let's say you are a bright student, but Hub is going to hire you and bring you to US. Then you are on your project, first project in Cisco. So project could be anything, any of the things that you learn from your science. So you have to start looking at two things. Hey, what is the data that this application has? And what are the functions that I need to write? Step number one. Step number two though, when you have a lot of data, what do you do? Common sense dictates when you have a lot of data, you start organizing the data. Okay? Like, let's say if you are developing a medical application, medical records application. They say, aha, uh -huh, all the information related to patients, I'm going to put them in one file, together, as we say, together. All the information related to doctors should be on the file. All the information related to uh, if it's some kind of a scheduling in medical world, rooms, what are the surgery rooms available. So you start grouping the data together. The grouping is what the data structure is. Okay. When you are grouping them, you have so many different types of structure, data structures available to us. Okay. Uh, for example, you, you learnt about NAC programming, right? You learnt about uh, linked lists. Another way of organizing is like a tree structure. When you have an organizational structure which tends to be hierarchical in nature, you organize them as a tree. So there are different types of organization or different types of data structures as we call it. Okay. So we are going to be learning to begin with. Before, and once we get a good handle on them, then we move into queues, stacks, okay, trees, different types of trees. Okay, we'll get into those types of things. Now, functions. Functions are very interesting. Functions are like just like how you wrote your C functions, right? You all did a first course in C programming. So you know how to, how to uh, write a function. Now, do you immediately start writing the function on the keyboard? When you have, let's say I want to do 
reserve a classroom. I am teaching a class. I am scheduling something. I want to write a function for reserve a classroom. So before I write the actual function, then I think. I mean, people, a lot of people, they write first, then think later. That's why they are bad programmers. What a good programmer does is they write what is known as an algorithm. Okay. An algorithm is nothing but a solution. Okay. Say, okay, step number one, let me do this. Step number two, let me do this. Step number three. Like that you write. That is an algorithm. An algorithm is nothing but a solution. And the way you write your algorithm typically is, instead of using a programming language directly, you use what is known as a pseudocode. So the code is very much English-like, right? And then, like just now I explained to you, step number one. There is no programming language to use in that called step number one. I just write it on a piece of paper. So the trick for every developer or architect is to come up with the data, the organization of the data, and to come up with the algorithm. Now, when somebody, like I'll give you an example. You all wrote a, a, a program uh, where you save elements in an array, right? You all know what an array is. Now, when I ask you to say, okay, give me an algorithm to uh, to sort the array. Okay, I'll give you a group of random numbers in an array. I want you to sort. There are so many different algorithms for that. One guy might write a bubble sort. One guy write, will write an algorithm which is called selection sort. One guy might write an algorithm called uh, heap sort or merge sort. Those are all the solutions which you sort in array. Okay? They are all right in their own way. That's where the fun begins in a data structure and analysis class, right? Say, okay, but I can write it in so many different ways. Then I have to figure out what is the best way. Right? Out of the three different ways of doing it, what is the ideal way? How do we answer that question? We'll learn that in this class. Predominantly, we answer those questions based on what is known as space time complex. Okay, so with that enough, with that speed, let me step through some slides. Okay? That's why you see, say, picking the best data structure for the job. So whatever data structure you pick should support the operations you need. Okay? He gives a good example here. When you have a list, you can insert and delete from the list. Whereas when you choose the data structure called stack, you push and pop. Okay. Now we do have what is known as an abstract data type. Like when we talk about abstract data type, is nothing but some kind of a model that we or we conceptualize some structure towards solutioning our problem domain. When you conceptualize it, an example of conceptualization is: I say, hey, this type of problem solution requires a queue. Like when you, let's say you're designing an operating system, okay? An operating system, you, I do not know if you took class or not an operating system yet. An operating system, one of the things that we talk about is uh, we schedule the jobs. We put them in something called a queue. And then the CPU would take uh, the elements out of the queue in a certain order. A queue order is nothing but first in, first out. Okay? First in, now. Q is an abstract concept. We use those concepts to understand our problem and to uh, solve the problem subsequently. But if you go to a programming language per se, you would not find in the syntax called Q. You cannot declare a variable of type Q. That is where we use these abstract data types. Okay? Abstract, they are abstract because they are not features of the language itself inherently. Okay. So we'll learn more about those kinds of things. Now what is an algorithm as we discussed? It's nothing but a high level language independent description of a step by step process to solve a problem. Okay, that is the key. 
the sentence is between the thing and the solid. Okay. So then you take the target, you take the name structure, okay. and then you combine them together if you're using an object oriented language to build the solution to implement the solution. Yeah, let me talk It is the speed of put it in the the speed is nobody puts anything in the chat, I think the speed is slow and I'll speed up more. And the speed is too fast, you have to tell me the slow up. Otherwise, you will get lost in this one, okay? So then we have a stack here, right? What is a stack? Uh, you all understand, like, uh, when you come to a hotel, how they will have all this uh, stack of plates, stack of plates, as we call it, right? Uh, stack of plates, when you're carrying a lot of food, you put one on top of them, and then one you can uh, Now, when you uh, carry the stack of food, uh, if you have a stack, which is the stack out of the stack, somebody can is it the bottom of the stack or the top of the stack that will take out the element? Stupid question. Okay. 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 To hear me. What about me? in between? I have to ask a question called Can you hear me? Okay, hold on. figure out, like, hey, you can't pop from an empty stack. There's nothing to pop in, there's nothing to take out. So you have an operation called D is empty. Okay. I'll check, hey, if the stack is empty, there's nothing to pop out. Otherwise, you pop the element out. Next one, please. Next one. So, whenever you realize when you are implementing these things, we always start with a conceptual model, right? We are always trying to understand the problem domain, the requirements that the user has as to what we are supposed to build. So, all of these things fall in the concept, in the realm of concepts, okay? Most of these concepts tend to be abstract in nature. Abstract meaning they are not really directly implementable. You have to you are understanding, like if you take, uh, if we take a database class, for example, we talk about an entity relationship model. That's an abstract model. Even a problem statement, we always say, what are the meaningful entities that we have? And what are the attributes? If I'm building a database system for class scheduling, meaningful concepts are students, 
and courses. Okay? So the entity is a student, the entity is a course. What what are the attributes that make up a student? Student name, student ID, student address, those are the attributes. But they are all abstract. And to come up with a solution to solve the problem, we write what is a pseudocode and an algorithm. Okay? And then all the data associated with that, we use some kind of an abstract data type, meaning it's some kind of a model where it's not directly available in a language. Okay? Now once you build your conceptual model, then you as a programmer have to go and implemented in a programming language and we use the constructs available to us in a programming language like array right single dimensional array two dimensional array okay, primitive data types like integer char pointer that's why you see mechanisms these are called the mechanisms meaning these are concretely available syntax tools in a given programming language to implement. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Now, this way the fun begins. Can there be just one big data structure, like one big bag, where we can use it for everything? Uh, typically not. There are so many different data structures, right? Like as I mentioned, I talked about lists, arrays, trees, linked lists, single linked lists, doubly linked lists, and so on. Because each one serves a different purpose. Now, when you when you have so many different data structures, then there has to be some kind of a criteria to figure out what is the right data structure for my problem. And the criteria that we use typically relies on this time versus space complex three performance elegance of an algorithm okay generality or simplicity sometimes you know i always say when you are trying to solve problems you know you apply the kiss strategy right his strategy is keep it simple stupid sometimes you want even though it might take a little bit more space you want it to be simple to understand and then some people's like as it says one operation's performance versus another okay so sometimes i mean to do a search uh, in an array a linear array would take much longer whereas to do the same search in a in a in a base tree like a binary sorted tree a binary search tree as we call it would be much faster इंट्रोड्यूसिंग some abstract data types here okay. again we'll go through these kinds of things in greater detail as throughout the course this is just to get your free trend okay we all understand the concept of a queue what is a queue first in first out right so as you can see here you have the queue there f e d c b are in the queue and q means you are adding an element into the queue d q means you are taking the element out of the queue So you started building the queue with A B C D E F, and then you took the first element out. A was the first element, so you took it out. Different operations for that: you create a queue. Because so remember, in, in computer language terms, you have to initialize a lot of these things. First, you have to create, you have to initialize, you use the data structure, then you destroy the object. Okay, that's why you see destroy. N Q means to. Put it there and take the queue to remove it. And you are always checking the queue is empty or not. Next one. So here is some notation that he has given you, where you actually use now. There is no structure called queue, right? In programming language, you wrote a, you wrote C programs. 
Are we seen in the syntax called something called Q? Probably not. Okay. So what? How do you implement the Q then? You. This is where you get concept to. Q is a concept, but you have to realize that with the mechanisms that are available to you in the programming language. So in the programming language, we have this mechanism called array. So now, how do you implement an array? What is the conceptual picture here showing you there? First of all, you said, my, the moment you say array, typically array has a fixed size. And since we compare sizes start from zero, the size is zero to size minus one. That is our Q. Q should have a, a front and a back of it, right? Because the moment you put the first element in the queue, that is the front of the queue. That is where you dequeue from. Right? That's why you see front is pointing to B. Okay? Now, whenever you call the dequeue operation, which is the second one that is showing, you are always taking the element from the front. Okay? And then spitting it out. In this case, the variable is X, where it is receiving it. After you do that, you have to move the front to the next one. Front plus one. Target person size and all that. That is to make the complete condition you have that. But basically you increment the pointer. To NQ means you are always NQ it as the back, not exactly back, back plus one. Or you can call it back actually, not back plus one. Back. Back is always pointing to the location where you can put an element. Or NQ and That's what you see in NQ of object. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. Next slide. Morning is Kuchuna. So that was an array, right? Now, as we go along, when we analyze these algorithms, you will figure out what are some drawbacks of array. Mm -hmm. Array is always a fixed size. Okay. If you have more elements than what the array size is, you cannot put them there. So that's why what we computer scientists do is we create what is known as a linked list. There is no specific static data structure with some size declared to begin with. What you do is as you keep getting the elements, you acquire memory, it's called dynamic memory allocation. In your C programming language, you would have used a concept called malloc. M A, I'll put it here, right? Memory allocation, we call it. Okay. And then we use this concept called linking. So as you keep putting the element, you keep building the links. Okay. I put B first. I, then I put C. After I put C, I put D. Okay. So you create this concept called a linear link list. In this case, a link, single link list. Okay. And the advantage of using the link list structure as opposed to array is you don't have to worry about running out of memory. Because array size is limited. If you have a smart aleck, you say, hey, if I do this a million times, maybe I'll still run out of memory. You are absolutely right. Okay. We are not talking about running out of memory at the system level. Okay. If I say array 1 to 100 or 0 to 99, I know that I can only have the queue of 99 elements. Okay. Whereas if I do a linked list, even if I have 150 elements, I should still be able to put it in the queue. Next slide. So the author has compared some these two things, circular array versus linked list. Okay. As you can see, the big thing is the linked list can grow as needed. You don't have to allocate space to begin with, and like in an array, it can keep growing. There is no looping around the front because it's not a circular array. Okay. However, it's like you get what you pay for, right? 
So the ramification of using linked lists is you have to write more code. And then it becomes more complex because you know how to manipulate the pointers. Next slide. Next slide. Now the other classic abstract data type is stack. So what did we do here? This is a unlike Q, which is a first in first out. The stack is a last in first out. Okay. Whatever goes in last is what is going to be popped out. That's what you see here. You have A, B, C, D, E, F. Right? Initially they pushed F on top of F is E and F. that is D and so on up to A. So you have to take a limit out of the stack that you see here. On the right side you took out A first followed by B, C, D, E, F is still in the stack. Next slide is So where do we use these concepts? One of the things that you should always question whether I am teaching or anyone else teaching is right. Everything that we teach here should have some practical application of it somewhere. Otherwise, there is no point teaching it unless you are an abstract mathematician, okay? So in compiler's class, you would learn about this function called stack. I'm getting the error message. Motigaru, did your system crash? No, sir, it is not. System crash. Procedure 2 calls procedure 3. How does the compiler keep track of all of these things? It uses what is known as a function called stack. Because it maintains the function called stack, it knows how to backtrack after the procedure is right. It should know where the control should pass again, right? So it knows how to keep track of it. Second one, in this class, you would also learn about recursion. When we write the Fibonacci series or some computing of interest and payroll and things like that, you will actually be using factorial if you are computing factorial and factorial. Typically, you write recursion. But you learn in this class, recursion is one of those things where it is very elegant, but it's very inefficient in terms of performance. So what we do is we typically remove recursion and make it like a regular function call, okay? where we use tags. So that's another way we use that. Uh, towards the latter half of the course, you would learn about how we do the matching. When you have an arithmetic expression, on a piece of paper we know how to match the parentheses, right? But how do you do it programmatically in a, in a system? We use stacks again then. Okay. Then you would learn about mm, these mathematical expressions called reverse Polish notation. Okay. We have prefix, uh, notation, and infix notation and postfix notation. So how we we use stack in those types of situations too. Next slide. Here is the fun part, right? Continue and go to the next slide in the meantime. So when we want to analyze, right, an algorithm, we want to analyze it from different perspectives. First and foremost, Remember, what is an algorithm? Algorithm is nothing but some kind of step-by-step -step process to solve a problem. Okay? If you are more mathematically inclined, you want to start writing proofs saying that my algorithm is correct. Correctness means does it do what it is intended. Funny thing is, if you are a mathematician, it, it, has, it is not just one part of it. You would also say, it, first of all, it does what it is intended to do. Second part is usually important to further them. It is not doing anything that they don't intend to do. He does not imply it. Okay. It's like this, you know, the algorithm for getting, uh, uh, let me give you a real life example, you know. 
the real life example is on the weekend my wife says hey i am busy with the kids go to indian store and go get milk for me okay the algorithm is i start the car i go to the trinetra super store bring milk and come back that is correct algorithm okay but have to be more correct than i say hey i will not go anywhere else to do anything else before i bring them back i just do what i am supposed to do. correctness is so it will do what is supposed to do plus it will not do what is not supposed to do okay if, if if some of you are lost in that explanation i can't help it i if you are a strong mathematics guy you will understand what i mean this is not the class for me to explain this statement completely okay that is one thing that we analyze as a sure the second one is quite frankly performance performance is nothing but what is the running time of the algorithm and how much storage does it consume so we look at those two things running time storage now when you have different algorithms which are correct which one do you use that's where we get into algorithm these are all the various reasons why this particular class is probably the most important class that you would ever take in computer science curriculum Okay, the most important class in my opinion, because when when we interview candidates, I wouldn't care less whether they can show the syntax of a language, whether it's C or a C plus plus or Java or a Python. Okay. What I give them is situations where they say, hey, "How would you solve this problem? Okay, how would you model the data? What kind of algorithm you would write?" If you solve those two problems and you do well in interview, you will get the job. Okay, next slide. So there is some recursive algorithm for some. Let's look at that. Continue. so um should i explain this or not so this is like i mean i'll explain it briefly but my intent my intention is not to turn this into a correctness class in automata theory and all i teach those things so typically what happens is the correctness one way of proving the correctness is that proof by induction right then actually when i much pen got on and much in upgrade after i became an engineer you learn this in what intermediate or something right where you have a basic step then you do an inductive hypothesis where you say hey if it holds valid for n equal to k then you try to prove that for n equal to k plus 1 it will hold value so that's what the author is trying to say here sometimes he is induction prove that whatever algorithm you came up with is correct okay? that's a theory that is great but the reality is no one really cares about these things okay in the industry what we care, care about is when you come to the office you are writing programming you say hey by the end of the day make it work man okay just make it work we will never say come and by end of the day show me the correctness proof for that if an academic type of guy yeah you write these types of proofs okay continue he shows some example of how to do the inductive proof continue i'm not going to cover the proofs here at least not now yeah proving correctness of an algorithm is very important ask any of your friend seniors in the industry have they written one correctness proof these are the guys who are making 150000 dollars base salary no one really writes it but i'm not discounting it i'm not making fun of these guys they are academic people they are scientists who do focus on some of these things but to write a web application to uh, take student registrations i wonder if somebody even worries about that right okay. so bottom line basically it's important okay and you can see there 
the second bullet, right? Pro proving correctness of a program is fraught with weird bugs. Okay, that's why we don't go there. Next slide. This is an interesting slide. So, how do you compare two algorithms, right? So, here's an example of sorting a list of names. That's the goal. Okay. <coughs> Different ways, right? You can see here, I'll buy a faster CPU. That means you'll write a bad, bad algorithm, but since you're executing in a faster CPU, you'll still get good run times. Good strategy. Okay. Some people will come and say, no, no, I'll use C++ instead of Java, because C is faster. C++ is just an extension of C. C by default is faster. Of course, the next quote is actually you not understand it unless you, you know, a little bit more. We're talking about is the big O notation, O4 flag and things like that. Basically, you think we are computing the order of computation. What is complexity like? big O or a theta or an omega and things like that. Now the other guy would, another program would say, hey, who cares how I do it? I'll simply keep adding more memory. Okay. Now another smart analyst would say, hey, if I'm sorting these things, can I just get the data pre-sorted? That means the guy doesn't need to do anything. Right? You would actually be, uh, that would be the kind of like going away exercise today for you guys. We'll, we'll talk about soft okay, as part of an exercise at the end of this class today. Continue. Wow, I have so many colleges joined today. I'm so happy. Why the Institute of Technology? I see some Students there, good morning to all of you. Who else I see videos? Wow, a lot of students. You can turn on your videos, guys. I see Kite video, I see PVP Siddhartha. Hacked classrooms, wow, that's night. Chakravarti Gar, you did something magic. This time I see a lot of <laughs> institutes and a lot of students. Very it goes to you. This is because, because of quality. Quality. <laughs> very nice. Very he took a lot of care. Very good. He is responsible, He's responsible for, for everything. Aona, good, good. Okay, excellent. We lucky we have to make them. We have to make the class more fun. I'm a little bit serious, Karivala. <laughs> Generally, Chakravarti got a truth because I have all my four kids at home today. My boys came this way. There's a big long weekend in the U.S. called Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, it's between now and this is like almost like officially the beginning of uh, the winter vacation for us. Nothing much gets accomplished in the month of December. And then second half of December, people go on vacation until the end of the year. So, full house, all fa family reunions. In in our case, we have a special thing to real special this weekend. And I've shared this with anyone yet in my class, I think. Uh, tomorrow, actually, that is Friday our time. It's already Friday for you. It's Thursday night for us here. Friday our time in the evening my our boy is actually getting engaged to a girl oh. so it's a big function family function for us oh. girl who have a keyword is approximation okay that's that is where we are headed to what is known as asymptotic analysis we ignore the small details hey i'm on a i'm in a class here guys that was my wife coming outside and saying. Okay, so we are always looking at rough estimates and then we ignore the details and I'll show you examples of what we say ignoring the details. Okay. Think of it like remember how you learned the in limit seven in H Kutagarma, differential equations to limits and all that. 
when we do those things right if you notice actually we ignore the constant factors and so on similar things we do here too we go to the next slide okay so uh, back 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 please sorry yeah one more uh, next slide yeah sorry next one perfect stop there so what we do here is when we are ignoring the details right we start off with what is called a big go analysis okay the terminology itself called big go big go and capital o or astron okay i hope you all know it telugu too in between sometimes i try to talk in telugu to prove to you that i still know telugu sorry gopal and my class okay so uh, sorry guys for the interruption there uh, i usually take uh, do my classes sitting in the garage but today there is a lot of activity in the garage all items are coming in things like that my apologies so what are the details that we ignore we ignore cpu speed when we compare algorithms i'm not saying hey this would work great on an intel machine versus an apple mac what i do is mostly theoretical analysis so i ignore cpu speed i ignore programming language how much memory compilers order of input size of input in a way so we ignore those things to quickly arrive at saying that hey which algorithm is better next slide so there are two important measures as i mentioned earlier two we we talked about what is time complexity how long it takes for the program to run the other one is space complexity how much memory it uses okay now we say the theory but you will notice as we go along 99% of the discussion revolves around time complexity we really don't talk much about the space complexity even though there is a lot of theory around that one practical reason for that really is space has become pretty cheap now right the amount of memory that we get now is ridiculously high at a very very low cost so by default most of the analysis revolves around the time complexity okay next slide Perfect. So you can see it. That's why I mean, this, is a, this is a great example of asymptotic analysis. So what is the author giving? He is giving functions there. Those are all functions, right? You all still remember some math? You know those are functions. So you have t of n four n plus five, t of n point five, n log n blah blah blah, and so on, right? Now what happens as n grows, right? Very simple example to explain to you what we do as mathematics and analysis, right? So if n if n is one, four plus five is nine. If n is two, eight plus five is thirteen. If n is three, twelve plus five is seventeen. So as you can see, as n is growing, four n is much much higher than the constant five, right? At some point, if n is hundred, four hundred plus five is four hundred five. So if I ignore five, I have a approximate of four hundred. Would I lose too much? I would not lose too much because four hundred is so big compared to four in relation to five. Four hundred is the predominant factor which is weighing the end result. So we start ignoring the constant five. So if you take similarly two raised to n plus n cube plus three n, what is the higher factor here? Which one grows faster as n grows? Two is to n, right? Exponential. We so start ignoring n cube and three n. Okay. Uh, same thing with n log n. So you and then you start ignoring two n and seven because n log n starts growing more and more and more. So that is actually the genesis of asymptotic analysis because asymptotic the reason why we say that is. This is the analysis that we do would be less than or equal to some other function g n. E n would be less than or equal to some other function g n. 
slightly less than because he was ignoring the constants. That is how the asymptotic name came about. Okay? And think of it as an approximation. Next slide. See, there is a reason why we do that is most algorithms are fast for small algorithms. Okay? Time difference is too small for an Right? Most often actually the external things like this IO. Most expensive operation is this IO. To go get data from a disk is a super expensive operation. It is 100 times slower to get it from a disk as opposed to getting it from, from memory. Uh, so, uh, by, by, by considering these factors, we say that, hey, when n is going to be so large in practice, we can start ignoring the smaller values. Okay? That's why we do this in terms of Next slide. Okay, I think this is the good one. What are we doing here? We are trying to search. So we are searching for a key. Okay. I think it's a great stopping point for today because I want you to spend the rest of the time to work on a couple of group exercises. Okay. And then when you do the group exercises, you are actually going to later post your solutions in the community as well. Great stopping point here for me as well as for you. So this is what I want you to do. Uh, you can use the whiteboard only if you want. Uh, check it out together. Can you go to one more slide and see? I want to see what they have. Okay, that's good. Go back and see. Yeah. So on the whiteboard you can write down the assignment only for today. Rest of the time, remember every class you would know that. Usually in the last 20 minutes or so, we do some exercise. You, depending on the subject matter, we'll do it even before also. There'll be many stopping points for you guys to do some in-class exercises. Okay, groups of two or three. This is one exercise where write an algorithm as to how you search. Given an array of elements, let's say I want to find, uh, find, find, find 37 in this array. What is the algorithm that I use? You don't have to write C programming. You can write it in C code or simple English. I mean, you can write it in pseudo code or simple English. Okay? Somebody can start off saying that, okay, I have an array. I'm going to initialize the array. Right? And do whatever. I don't know what you do there. Okay? How would you search for a given element here? That is one exercise. Okay. The second exercise is uh, take the same array, jumble up the numbers. Okay. In this case, this looks like a sorted array, right? Yeah, it is a sorted array. But take an array, jumble up the numbers, meaning they are not sorted. I want you to write a sort algorithm. How do you sort the elements of an array? Okay, write a code in class. If you are done, you run out of time. Outside of the class, the same two, three people get together in a lunch room or cafeteria or library, work on it. How do you sort elements of an array? Everyone understands the two questions? You can put it on the whiteboard and check it out together. And you can bring up the whiteboard, not the PowerPoint. Perfect. Two questions. Um, check out together the writing them. Working for you. Write through an algorithm to search for an element in an array. That is question number one. Turn on your video so that way I can see that your students are working. 
give them a piece of a piece of paper and a pencil groups of two or three gather around a table and start working okay if you have written your c if you have really done your c programming class with some college can you use programming in your c programming class you would have done this too so think of this as refreshing or if you have not done it here is an opportunity for you to learn for these two things okay. for each of your groups in the community how you post it you say start a discussion uh, and then you post it okay and i'm going to i expect to see almost all of you enrolled in this class in the community by time we do our next class which is going to be on